Book Four, Part Two of the Republic by Plato. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Here I saw something. Hello, I said. I begin to perceive a track, and I believe that the quarry will not escape. Good news, he said. Truly, I said, we are stupid fellows. Why so? Why, my good sir, at the beginning of our inquiry, ages ago, there was justice tumbling out at our feet, and we never saw her. Nothing could be more ridiculous, like people who go about looking for what they have in their hands. That was the way with us. We looked not at what we were seeking, but at what was far off in the distance, and therefore, I suppose, we missed her. What do you mean? I mean to say that in reality, for a long time past, we have been talking of justice, and have failed to recognize her. I grow impatient at the length of your exordium. Well, then, tell me, I said, whether I am right or not. You remember the original principle which we were always laying down at the foundation of the state, that one man should practice one thing only, the thing to which his nature was best adapted. Now, justice is this principle, or a part of it. Yes, we often said that one man should do one thing only. Further, we affirmed that justice was doing one's own business, and not being a busybody. We said so again and again, and many others have said the same to us. Yes, we said so. Then to do one's own business in a certain way may be assumed to be justice. Can you tell me whence I derive this inference? I cannot, but I should like to be told. Because I think that this is the only virtue which remains in the state when the other virtues of temperance and courage and wisdom are abstracted, and that this is the ultimate cause and condition of the existence of all of them, and while remaining in them is also their preservative. And we were saying that if the three were discovered by us, justice would be the fourth or remaining one. Well, that follows of necessity. If we are asked to determine which of these four qualities by its presence contributes most to the excellence of the state, whether the agreement of rulers and subjects, or the preservation in the soldiers of the opinion which the law ordains about the true nature of dangers, or wisdom and watchfulness in the rulers, or whether this other which I am mentioning, and which is found in children and women, slave and freeman, artisan, ruler, subject, the quality, I mean, of everyone doing his own work, and not being a busybody, would claim the palm, the question is not so easily answered. Certainly, he replied, there would be a difficulty in saying which. Then the power of each individual in the state to do his own work appears to compete with the other political virtues, wisdom, temperance, courage. Yes, he said. And the virtue which enters into this competition is justice? Exactly. Let us look at the question from another point of view. Are not the rulers in a state those to whom you would entrust the office of determining suits at law? Certainly and are suits decided on any other ground but that a man may neither take what is another's nor be deprived of what is his own yes that is their principle which is a just principle yes then on this view also justice will be admitted to be the having and doing what is a man's own and belongs to him very true think now and say whether you agree with me or not suppose a carpenter to be doing the business of a cobbler or a cobbler of a carpenter and suppose them to exchange their implements or their duties or the same person to be doing the work of both or whatever be the change do you think that any great harm would result to the state not much but when the cobbler or any other man whom nature designed to be a trader having his heart lifted up by wealth or strength or the number of his followers or any like advantage attempts to force his way into the class of warriors or a warrior into that of legislators and guardians for which he is unfitted and either to take the implements or the duties of the other 
or when a man is trader, legislator, and warrior all in one, then I think you will agree with me in saying that this interchange and this meddling of one with another is the ruin of the state. Most true. Seeing then, I said, that there are three distinct classes, any meddling of one with another, or the change of one into another, is the greatest harm to the state, and may be most justly termed evil-doing. Precisely. And the greatest degree of evil-doing to one's own city would be termed by you injustice? Certainly. This, then, is injustice, and on the other hand, when the trader, the auxiliary, and the guardian each do their own business, that is justice, and will make the city just. I agree with you. We will not, I said, be over-positive as yet. But if, on trial, this conception of justice be verified in the individual, as well as in the state, there will be no longer any room for doubt. If it be not verified, we must have a fresh inquiry. First, let us complete the old investigation, which we began, as you remember, under the impression that, if we could previously examine justice on the larger scale, there would be less difficulty in discerning her in the individual. That larger example appeared to be the state, and accordingly we constructed as good a one as we could, knowing well that in the good state justice would be found. Let the discovery which we made be now applied to the individual. If they agree, we shall be satisfied, or if there be a difference in the individual, we will come back to the state and have another trial of the theory. The friction of the two, when rubbed together, may possibly strike a light in which justice will shine forth, and the vision which is then revealed we will fix in our souls. That will be in regular course. Let us do as you say. I proceeded to ask, when two things, a greater and less, are called by the same name, are they like or unlike in so far as they are called the same? Like, he replied. The just man, then, if we regard the idea of justice only, will be like the just state? He will. And a state was thought by us to be just when the three classes in the state severally did their own business, and also thought to be temperate and valiant and wise by reason of certain other affections and qualities of these same classes. True, he said and so of the individual. We may assume that he has the same three principles in his own soul which we find in the state, and he may be rightly described in the same terms, because he is affected in the same manner. Certainly, he said. Once more, then, O oh my friend, we have alighted upon an easy question, whether the soul has these three principles or not. An easy question, Nay, rather, Socrates, the proverb holds that hard is the good. Very true, I said, and I do not think that the method which we are employing is at all adequate to the accurate solution of this question. The true method is another and a longer one. Still, we may arrive at a solution not below the level of the previous inquiry. Oh, may we not be satisfied with that? he said, under the circumstances, I am quite content. I, too, I replied, shall be extremely well satisfied. Then fate not in pursuing the speculation, he said. Must we not acknowledge, I said, that in each of us there are the same principles and habits which there are in the state, and that from the individual they pass into the state? How else can they come there? Take the quality of passion or spirit. It would be ridiculous to imagine that this quality, when found in states, is not derived from the individuals who are supposed to possess it. For example, the Thracians, the Scythians, and in general the northern nations, and the same may be said of the love of knowledge, which is the special characteristic of our part of the world, or the love of money, which may, with equal truth, be attributed to the Phoenicians and Egyptians. Exactly so, he said. There is no difficulty in understanding this. None whatever. 
but the question is not quite so easy when we proceed to ask whether these principles are three or one, whether, that is to say, we learn with one part of our nature, are angry with another, and with a third part desire the satisfaction of our natural appetites, or whether the whole soul comes into play in each sort of action. To determine that is the difficulty. Yes, he said, there lies the difficulty. Then let us now try and determine whether they are the same or different. How can we? he asked. I replied as follows. The same thing clearly cannot act or be acted upon in the same part, or in relation to the same thing at the same time in contrary ways. And therefore, whenever this contradiction occurs in things apparently the same, we know that they are really not the same, but different. Good. For example, I said, can the same thing be at rest and in motion at the same time in the same part? Or impossible. Still, I said, let us have a more precise statement of terms, lest we should hereafter fall out by the way. Imagine the case of a man who is standing and also moving his hands and his head, and suppose a person to say that one and the same person is in motion and at rest at the same moment. To such a mode of speech we should object, and should rather say that one part of him is in motion while another is at rest. Very true. And suppose the objector to refine still further, and to draw the nice distinction that not only parts of tops, but whole tops, when they spin round with their pegs fixed on the spot, are at rest and in motion at the same time, and he may say the same of anything which revolves in the same spot, his objection would not be admitted by us, because, in such cases, things are not at rest and in motion in the same parts of themselves. We should rather say that they have both an axis and a circumference, and that the axis stands still, for there is no deviation from the perpendicular, and that the circumference goes around. But if, while revolving, the axis inclines, either to the right or left, forwards or backwards, then in no point of view can they be at rest. That is the correct mode of describing them, he replied. Then none of these objections will confuse us, or incline us to believe that the same thing at the same time, in the same part, or in relation to the same thing, can act or be acted upon in contrary ways. Certainly not, according to my way of thinking. Yet, I said, that we may not be compelled to examine all such objections, and prove at length that they are untrue, let us assume their absurdity, and go forward, on the understanding that hereafter, if this assumption turn out to be untrue, all the consequences which follow shall be withdrawn. Yes, he said, that will be the best way. Well, I said, would you not allow that assent and dissent, desire and aversion, attraction and repulsion, are all of them opposites, whether they are regarded as active or passive, for that makes no difference in the fact of their opposition. Yes, he said, they are opposites. Well, I said, and hunger and thirst, and the desires in general, and, again, willing and wishing, all these you would refer to the classes already mentioned. You would say, would you not, that the soul of him who desires is seeking after the object of his desire, or that he is drawing to himself the thing which he wishes to possess, or, again, when a person wants anything to be given him, his mind, longing for the realization of his desire, intimates his wish to have it by a nod of assent, as if he had been asked a question. Very true. And what would you say of unwillingness and dislike and the absence of desire? Should not these be referred to the opposite class of repulsion and rejection? Certainly. Admitting this to be true of desire generally, let us suppose a particular class of desires, and out of these we will select hunger and thirst, as they are termed, which are the most obvious of them. Let us take that class, he said. The object of one is food, and of the other drink. 
Yes. And here comes the point. Is not thirst the desire which the soul has of drink, and of drink only, not of drink qualified by anything else? For example, warm or cold, or much or little, or, in a word, drink of any particular sort. But if the thirst be accompanied by heat, then the desire is of cold drink, or, if accompanied by cold, then of warm drink, or, if the thirst be excessive, then the drink which is desired will be excessive, or, if not great, the quantity of drink will also be small, but thirst, pure and simple, will desire drink, pure and simple, which is the natural selection of thirst, as food is of hunger. Yes, he said, the simple desire is, as you say, in every case of the simple object, and the qualified desire of the qualified object. But here a confusion may arise, and I should wish to guard against an opponent starting up and saying that no man desires drink only, but good drink, or food only, but good food. For good is the universal object of desire, and thirst, being a desire, will necessarily be thirst after good drink, and the same is true of every other desire. Yes, he replied, the opponent might have something to say. Nevertheless, I should still maintain that of relatives some have a quality attached to either term of the relation, others are simple and have their correlatives simple. I do not know what you mean. Well, you know, of course, that the greater is relative to the less, well, certainly, and the much greater to the much less, yes, and the sometime greater to the sometime less, and the greater that is to be to the less that is to be. Certainly, he said, and so of more and less, and of other correlative terms, such as the double and the half, or, or again the heavier and the lighter, the swifter and the slower, and of hot and cold, and of any other relatives, is not this true of all of them? Yes. And does not the same principle hold in the sciences? The object of science is knowledge, assuming that to be the true definition, but the object of a particular science is a particular kind of knowledge. I mean, for example, that the science of house-building is a kind of knowledge which is defined and distinguished from other kinds, and is therefore termed architecture. Certainly, because it has a particular quality which no other has. Yes, and it has this particular quality because it has an object of a particular kind, and this is true of the other arts and sciences. Yes. Now then, if I made myself clear, you will understand my original meaning in what I said about relatives. My meaning was that if one term of a relation is taken alone, the other is taken alone. If one term is qualified, the other is also qualified. I do not mean to say that relatives may not be desperate, or that the science of health is healthy, or of disease necessarily disease, or that the sciences of good and evil are therefore good and evil, but only that when the term science is no longer used absolutely, but has a qualified object which in this case is the nature of health and disease, it becomes defined, and is hence called not merely science, but the science of medicine. I quite understand, and I think as you do. Would you not say that thirst is one of these essentially relative terms, having clearly a relation? Yes, thirst is relative to drink. And a certain kind of thirst is relative to a certain kind of drink. But thirst taken alone is neither of much nor little, nor of good nor bad, nor of any particular kind of drink but of drink only. Certainly. Then the soul of the thirsty one, in so far as he is thirsty, desires only drink, for this he yearns and tries to obtain it. That is plain. And if you suppose something which pulls a thirsty soul away from drink, that must be different from the thirsty principle which draws him like a beast to drink. For as we were saying, the same thing cannot at the same time, with the same part of itself, act in contrary ways about the same. Impossible. 
no more than you can say that the hands of the archer push and pull the bow at the same time. But what you say is that one hand pushes and the other pulls. Exactly so, he replied. And might a man be thirsty and yet unwilling to drink? Yes, he said. It constantly happens. And in such a case, what is one to say? Would you not say that there was something in the soul bidding a man to drink, and something else forbidding him, which is other and stronger than the principle which bids him? I should say so. And the forbidding principle is derived from reason, and that which bids and attracts proceeds from passion and disease? Clearly. Then we may fairly assume that they are two, and that they differ from one another. The one with which a man reasons we may call the rational principle of the soul, the other we may call the rational principle of the soul, the other with which he loves and hungers and thirsts and feels the flutterings of any other desire may be termed the irrational or appetitive, the ally of sundry pleasures and satisfactions. Yes, he said, we may fairly assume them to be different. Then let us finally determine that there are two principles existing in the soul. And what of passion or spirit? Is it a third or akin to one of the preceding? I should be inclined to say akin to desire. Well, I said, there is a story which I remember to have heard and in which I put faith. The story is that Leontius, the son of Alglion, coming up one day from the Piraeus, under the north wall on the outside, observed some dead bodies lying on the ground at the place of execution. He felt a desire to see them, and also a dread and abhorrence of them. For a time he struggled and covered his eyes, but at length the desire got the better of him, and forcing them open, he ran up to the dead bodies, saying, Look, ye wretches, take your fill of the fair sight. I have heard the story myself, he said. The moral of the tale is that anger at times goes to war with desire, as though they were two distinct things. Yes, that is the meaning, he said. And are there not many other cases in which we observe that when a man's desires violently prevail over his reason, he reviles himself and is angry at the violence within him, and that in this struggle, which is like the struggle of factions in a state, his spirit is on the side of his reason. But for the passionate or spirited element to take part with the desires when reason decides that she should not be opposed, is a sort of thing which I believe that you never observed occurring in yourself, nor, as I should imagine, in any one else. Certainly not. Suppose that a man thinks he has done a wrong to another, the nobler he is, the less able he is to feel indignant at any suffering, such as hunger or cold, or any other pain which the injured person may inflict upon him. These he deems to be just, and, as I say, his anger refuses to be excited by them. True, he said. But when he thinks that he is the sufferer of the wrong, then he boils and chafes, and is on the side of what he believes to be justice, and because he suffers hunger or cold or other pain, he is only the more determined to persevere and conquer. His noble spirit will not be quelled until he either slays or is slain, or until he hears the voice of the shepherd, that is, reason, bidding his dog bark no more. The illustration is perfect, he replied, and in our state, as we were saying, the auxiliaries were to be dogs, and to hear the voice of the rulers, who are their shepherds. I perceive, I said, that you quite understand me. There is, however, a further point which I wish to consider. What point? You remember that passion or spirit appeared at first sight to be a kind of desire. But now we should say quite the contrary. For in the conflict of the soul, spirit is arrayed on the side of the rational principle. Most assuredly. But a further question arises. 
Is passion different from reason also, or only a kind of reason, in which latter case, instead of three principles in the soul, there will be only two, the rational and the concupiscent, or rather, as the state was composed of three classes, traders, auxiliaries, counsellors, so may there not be in the individual soul a third element which is passion or spirit, and when not corrupted by bad education, is the natural auxiliary of reason. Yes, he said, there must be a third. Yes, I replied, if passion, which has already been shown to be different from desire, turns out also to be different from reason. But that is easily proved. We may observe even in young children that they are full of spirit almost as soon as they are born, whereas some of them never seem to attain the use of reason, and most of them late enough. Excellent, I said, and you may see passion equally in brute animals, which is a further proof of the truth of what you are saying, and we may once more appeal to the words of Homer, which have already been quoted by us, he smote his breast, and thus rebuked his soul. For in this verse Homer has clearly supposed the power which reasons about the better and worse to be different from the unreasoning anger which is rebuked by it. Very true, he said. And so, after much tossing, we have reached land, and are fairly agreed that the same principles which exist in the state exist also in the individual and that they are three in number. Exactly. Must we not then infer that the individual is wise in the same way, and in virtue of the same quality which makes the state wise? Certainly. Also, that the same quality which constitutes courage in the state constitutes courage in the individual, and that both the state and the individual bear the same relation to all the other virtues? Assuredly and the individual will be acknowledged by us to be just in the same way in which the state is just? Well, that follows, of course. We cannot but remember that the justice of the state consisted in each of the three classes doing the work of its own class. We are not very likely to have forgotten, he said. We must recollect that the individual in whom the several qualities of his nature do their own work will be just, and will do his own work. Yes, he said, we must remember that too. And ought not the rational principle which is wise and has the care of the whole soul to rule, and the passionate or spirited principle to be the subject and ally? Certainly. And, as we were saying, the united influence of music and gymnastic will bring them into accord, nerving and sustaining the reason with noble words and lessons, and moderating and soothing and civilizing the wildness of passion by harmony and rhythm. Quite true, he said. And these two, thus nurtured and educated, and having learned truly to know their own functions, will rule over the concupiscent, which in each of us is the largest part of the soul, and by nature, most insatiable of gain. Over this they will keep guard, lest, waxing great and strong with a fullness of bodily pleasures, as they are termed, the concupiscent soul, no longer confined to her own sphere, should attempt to enslave and rule those who are not her natural-born subjects, and overturn the whole life of man. Very true, he said. Both together will they not be the best defenders of the whole soul and the whole body against attack from without, the one counselling and the other fighting under his leader, and courageously executing his commands and counsels? True. And he is to be deemed courageous whose spirit retains in pleasure and in pain the commands of reason about what he ought or ought not to fear. Right he replied. And him we will call wise, who has in him that little part which rules, and which proclaims these commands, that part too being supposed to have a knowledge of what is for the interest of each of the three parts, and of the whole. Assuredly. 
and would you not say that he is temperate who has these same elements in friendly harmony in whom the one ruling principle of reason and the two subject ones of spirit and desire are equally agreed that reason ought to rule and do not rebel certainly he said that is the true account of temperance whether in the state or individual and surely i said we have just explained again and again how and by virtue of what quality a man will be just that is very certain and is justice dimmer in the individual and is her form different or is she the same which we found her to be in the state there is no difference in my opinion he said because if any doubt is still lingering in our minds a few commonplace instances will satisfy us of the truth of what i am saying what sort of instances do you mean if the case is put to us we must not admit that the just state or the man who is trained in the principles of such a state will be less likely than the unjust to make away with a deposit of gold or silver would any one deny this no one he replied will the just man or citizen ever be guilty of sacrilege or theft or treachery either to his friends or to his country never neither will he ever break faith where there have been oaths or agreements impossible no one will be less likely to commit adultery or to dishonor his father and mother or to fail in his religious duties no one and the reason is that each part of him is doing its own business whether in ruling or being ruled exactly so are you satisfied then that the quality which makes such men and such states is justice or do you hope to discover some other but not i indeed then our dream has been realized and the suspicion which we entertained at the beginning of our work of construction that some divine power must have conducted us to a primary form of justice has now been verified yes certainly and the division of labor which required the carpenter and the shoemaker and the rest of the citizens to be doing each his own business and not another's was a shadow of justice and for that reason it was of use clearly but in reality justice was such as we were describing being concerned however not with the outward man but with the inward which is the true self and concernment of man for the just man does not permit the several elements within him to interfere with one another or any of them to do the work of others he sets in order his own inner life and is his own master and his own law and at peace with himself and when he has bound together the three principles within him which may be compared to the higher lower and middle notes of a scale and the intermediate intervals when he has bound all these together and is no longer many but has become one entirely temperate and perfectly adjusted nature then he proceeds to act if he has to act whether in a matter of property or in the treatment of the body or in some affair of politics or private business always thinking and calling that which preserves and cooperates with this harmonious condition just and good action and the knowledge which presides over it wisdom and which at any time impairs this condition he will call unjust action and the opinion which presides over it ignorance you have said the exact truth socrates very good and if we were to affirm that we had discovered the just man and the just state and the nature of justice in each of them we should not be telling a falsehood most certainly not may we say so then let us say so and now i said injustice has to be considered clearly must not injustice be a strife which arises among the three principles of meddlesomeness and interference and rising up of a part of the soul against the whole an assertion of unlawful authority which is made by a rebellious subject against a true prince of whom he is the natural vassal 
what is all this confusion and delusion but injustice and intemperance and cowardice and ignorance and every form of vice exactly so and if the nature of justice and injustice be known then the meaning of acting unjustly and being unjust or again of acting justly will also be perfectly clear what do you mean he said why i said they are like disease and health being in the soul just what disease and health are in the body how so he said why i said that which is healthy causes health and that which is unhealthy causes disease yes and just actions cause justice and unjust actions cause injustice well that is certain and the creation of health is the institution of a natural order and government of one by another in the parts of the body and the creation of disease is the production of a state of things at variance with this natural order true and is not the creation of justice the institution of a natural order and government of one by another in the parts of the soul and the creation of injustice the production of a state of things at variance with the natural order exactly so he said then virtue is the health and beauty and well-being of the soul and vice the disease and weakness and deformity of the same true and do not good practices lead to virtue and evil practices to vice assuredly still our old question of the comparative advantage of justice and injustice has not been answered which is the more profitable to be just and act justly and practise virtue whether seen or unseen of gods and men or to be unjust and act unjustly if only unpunished and unreformed in my judgment socrates the question has now become ridiculous we know that when the bodily constitution is gone life is no longer endurable though pampered with all kinds of meats and drinks and having all wealth and all power and shall we be told that when the very essence of the vital principle is undermined and corrupted life is still worth having to a man if only he be allowed to do whatever he likes with the single exception that he is not to acquire justice and virtue or to escape from injustice and vice assuming them both to be such as we have described yes i said the question is as you say ridiculous still as we are near the spot at which we may see the truth in the clearest manner with our own eyes let us not faint by the way certainly not he replied come up hither i said and behold the various forms of vice those of them i mean which are worth looking at i am following you he replied proceed i said the argument seems to have reached a height from which as from some tower of speculation a man may look down and see that virtue is one but that the forms of vice are innumerable there being four special ones which are deserving of note what do you mean he said i mean i replied that there appear to be as many forms of the soul as there are distinct forms of the state how many there are five of the state and five of the soul i said what are they the first i said is that which we have been describing and which may be said to have two names monarchy and aristocracy accordingly as rule is exercised by one distinguished man or by many true he replied but i regard the two names as describing one form only for whether the government is in the hands of one or many if the governors have been trained in the manner which we have supposed the fundamental laws of the state will be maintained that is true he replied. End of Book Four.